I invite you to turn with me in Scripture to Genesis chapter 1. I hope to proclaim the Word of God on centered around verse 28, but I'd like to read to remind us of the context here, the verses 26 through 31. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. So we'll be focusing then on verse 28. After the gospel has been proclaimed, we'll sing Psalm 128, 128 stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Church of our Lord Jesus Christ, the last time I was privileged to be in your midst, we dealt with what it means to be created in the image of God. As God's image in this world and as people who are now being recreated in that image by the Spirit of Christ, we have a calling. We are called to reflect God to the world, to be like a mirror, so to speak, so that when people look at us, when they observe us, when they interact with us, they see something coming out of us that resembles the righteousness and holiness of our Maker. And the hope is that by seeing that in us, they would be drawn to inquire about that and ask about the God we serve. Well, that's reflecting God's image, but there's still more to being God's image. It also involves representing God in creation as His vicegerent, as His appointed king over creation. The Lord speaks of that task in the same breath as His image, verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. That's the key thing. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So man, the image of God, is made ruler over the creatures of God, indeed, over all creation. We've got to exercise dominion. That's our calling. But what exactly does that mean? None of us are kings, as far as I know. None of us are descended from royalty. We don't have blue blood flowing through our veins. We're just simple people. We're trying to make ends meet every day. So how is it that we as landscapers or technicians, teachers, mechanics, mothers, fathers, salespeople, administrators, and more, how do we go about exercising dominion over creation? Well, we hope to answer that question together as I proclaim to you this word of the Lord under this theme. God created you to exercise dominion over the earth. We do this through two primary ways. We do it through our work, 
and we do it through our marriages. Well, our text in verse 28 has a number of commands for humanity, and the Lord uses some specific and very telling verbs, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all creatures. To have or exercise dominion, that means to have authority over, to rule over those things. So the earth, it is said to us here, the earth needs to be subdued. The animals need to be ruled over, says the Lord. So the Creator is telling man that action is required on our part, that Mankind has a responsibility in and over all creation. In other words, brothers and sisters, the Lord God, He put Adam and Eve to work, and you and I along with them. And a lot of people may be surprised by this. Lots of people see work and labor as a curse, as something that came about as a result of sin. And they only wish they could live in the Garden of Eden. Didn't God create a paradise for Adam and Eve? Wasn't the Garden of Place a, a place to enjoy leisure, tranquility, serenity? In popular culture, if people think about the Garden of Eden, they think that Adam and Eve had it made in the shade. They had all they needed at their disposal, and so they lounged about in perfect bliss, but brothers and sisters, a careful look at the text leads us to conclude, and we should have no mistake about it, Adam and Eve were busy working inside the Garden of Eden. That comes out in chapter 2, verse 15, for example, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to keep it. So paradise is not like a vacation on the beaches of Mexico. Paradise is, is neither lounging by the poolside in Florida, it's not spending your day on the links trying to lower your golf score and your handicap. Paradise itself requires tending, says the Lord. Way before sin entered this world, man was created to labor. In fact, work itself is a blessing from the Lord. I wonder if you've thought of it that way. Notice how our text begins. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, and then comes the commands, including have dominion over the fish of the sea, that all, and that includes our work. So, so work is part and parcel of God's blessing over man, just as much as having children is a blessing. And that applies to life after the fall, just as much as to life before the fall, work in a world that's filled with sin will certainly have its challenges and difficulties and hardships, but work is still a gift from God that He blesses man with and He calls us to undertake. That's what's behind Paul's exhortations in 2 Thessalonians 3, which we read. He reminds the Christians there how the apostles were had earlier labored among them to provide for themselves while they were teaching the Thessalonians the gospel. And they did that, says Paul, as an example to these new believers that they should go about their work quietly. And he says, and I quote, to earn their own living. Paul is very categorical about this in his commands to the Thessalonians. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. There was to be no idleness. It is true, of course, that we humans ruined the harmony of the original creation by our sin, but our Lord Jesus Christ is restoring what we ruined, and He continues the same mandate that God gave at creation, go to work subduing the earth and ruling the animals. And that word, that verb subdue in our text is rather striking. In every other instance in Scripture, it has a kind of negative connotation. 
it often has to do with putting one or one person putting another person kind of under his thumb usually by force in scripture nations are said to be subdued enemies are subdued slaves are subdued it means to bring someone under your control so that it does your will he or that person or that thing does your will and it's usually against their will well here we are in creation where there is yet no sin in the world so the negative connotation can't be there and yet the world we understand does not bring forth its bounty automatically it doesn't just rise up the earth and and lay at man's feet all that it has to offer man has to go and get it the earth had no sin in it but it was a world that was as yet undeveloped untapped a world with incredible even endless potential for growth and expansion but man had to go after it that's the point of these commands mankind and his labor are like a key which unlocks the potential of the earth we see that clearly enough in eden in the garden the lord started adam and eve off with a, a grove of fruit trees from which they could pick and eat he even gave them a stock supply of food so that they could get going but he expected them to also work for their daily bread the lord had also given to man every seed bearing plant we read at the end of chapter 1 but to receive the benefits of seed bearing plants to receive a, a crop from those seed bearing plants uh, be it wheat or, or rice or boot and cool or potatoes or whatever they had at their disposal for that man would have to labor man would have to till or cultivate the soil that was the command keep till and keep the garden just like farmers every year have to till their fields you probably rototill your garden every spring so our first parents they had to learn how to prepare the ground how to plant seeds and how to nurture those seeds along so if we now ask well what does it mean to have dominion over the earth to to subdue the earth it means this through our daily work we bring creation under our control not to dominate creation as some kind of cruel taskmaster or tyrant not to mistreat god's creation for our own pleasure but rather to bring out of creation the potential that god put in it we in fact as christians we ought to be more concerned than the environmentalists the green people about caring for this earth because unlike them we know what this earth is this is god's handiwork we are caretakers of god's handiwork that should give us a powerful motivation to be diligent in caring for the earth not trying to pillage it to maximum benefit for ourselves our task is to work with the raw materials that god provides and to develop them in accordance with their nature to make them do what they are able to do and make them be what they can be as god gave each part of creation its ability and by as we do that as we bring the ability and possibility of god's creation to to light to fruition we not only show the wonder of creation but even more we show the wisdom and the power and the majesty of the creator if we can do something special with creation it reflects on the creator you see whatever beauty we can develop whatever technology we can produce whatever good and useful purpose we can make the earth and its resources serve all of it is only feasible and possible because god made it so he created the earth that way and so all the praise redounds to him and this applies to animals just as well we are called here in our text to rule over the animals 
so that the animals can also fulfill their potential. Let's think of Adam and Eve's situation to make it a bit more concrete. There they were in the Garden of Eden. They had the command to till the earth. How were they going to till the earth? Perhaps at first they began with their hands in, in the soil. But it's not hard to imagine that they soon would have thought about reaching for a branch of a tree to form some kind of basic implement, hoe or shovel, to help more easily till the earth. We know for a fact also that all sorts of animals roamed through Eden, including horses and bulls, without doubt. So the thought couldn't have been too far from Adam's mind to, to harness the strength of these animals. Again, not in a, the forced way that we have to do it now, but in a cooperative way, because the animals would have cooperated with Adam and Eve, to harness their strength to help him or them till the earth. That way they could till more of the earth more quickly. They could produce a bigger crop. They could feed more children as they would expect children to be born to them. And so you can understand that the development of technology would have come out of the command to work and, and till the earth. Well, fast forward to today, to your situation, to my situation. What this means for us, beloved, is that every day when you go to work, you take your cup of coffee from Tim's and you go to work, whether that's work in manufacturing windows and doors or framing houses or doing administrative tasks or managing financial matters or serving as a nurse or PSW or being on an assembly line, you name the labor, whether it's in primary, secondary, or tertiary industry, whatever your daily occupation is, there you are exercising dominion over the earth in your little slice of the world. You have a part, I have a part in this creation mandate. Each of us a small part, but your daily way work in some way, shape, or form contributes to the development of the world. It contributes to the development of human society for the glory of God. You know, a lot of people in this world have totally lost that concept, eh? Most people in their daily jobs, they give zero thought to God. Zero thought to glorifying the Lord. They simply work for their own needs, their own satisfaction or their own pleasure or other purposes. For some, work is the thing for which they live. They love their work so much, they're... They're into it so much, it's actually become their God. For others, it's the opposite. Work is a drudgery, a necessary evil. Maybe you've heard people say, maybe you said it yourself, I'm, I'm, this job, I'm just working for the paycheck. Everybody's working for the weekend, it seems. And so work for the world has lost its meaning, it's lost its value, its purpose. But brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus has changed all of that for you and me and for all those who belong to Him. Work's got meaning. His redemption goes beyond our souls to include our bodies and to include all of creation. <coughs> By His death, the Lord Jesus has removed the curse from over us. He's restored and renewed the creation mandate, our cultural mandate, to work as kings and queens in His creation. Our labor is not a useless toil anymore. It has value in Christ. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's also why he commands the Thessalonians, labor, work. It has purpose. It has meaning. It's doing it for the Lord. So work itself, to be clear, it's not your God. Jesus is your God. So every day when you go to work, you labor for Christ. You're not just working for a paycheck, even if the job is not to your liking. And everybody knows that some jobs are not to our liking. But you work for the Lord. You don't work first for that paycheck. You don't work for the weekend. Every day your labor brings to light a little piece of creation's potential. And through that 
the world sees a little glimpse of God's glory. A glimpse which is also seen in our families, in our marriages. For the Lord connects very strongly our dominion over the earth with the procreation of children. Verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So part of exercising dominion over the earth is to populate the earth with many people. Fill it up, says the Lord. And when you put yourself back in Adam and Eve's shoes, or well, maybe they didn't have shoes, but you know what I mean, um, you can understand this command from a practical point of view. How were they just as two human beings going to fulfill this command to exercise dominion over this huge, huge world. <laughs> in order to, to reign in creation, in order to, to start tapping its resources and developing it, Adam and Eve simply needed manpower, a lot of it. And in God's wisdom, the manpower would come through the birth of children in and out of their marriages. The growth of our families, you see, is every bit a part of our cultural mandate to subdue the earth, just as much as our work is. Now, before we go further, I'd like to just pause and think about God's design here as He gives this command. The way He deals with man is quite different and stands in contrast to the way God dealt with the animals. If you were to look back to chapter 1, verse 20, for instance, you would see the command there, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. Something similar occurs in verse 24, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. So when it comes to the animals and the water creatures and the birds, they were all created in a multitude. They were created in a variety of species with more than one of each kind. But when God created man, He made just one being, Adam. Later that day, He made Eve and gave Eve to Adam as wife. But there were no multiple species of mankind, nor was there a multitude of people. The Lord certainly could have, if He had wanted to, He could have made hundreds of thousands of people at first, just like He made um, hundreds of thousands of fish. He could have given Adam and Eve many helpers right away, but by the end of day six, there was only one male and one female. And God brought them together as husband and wife and commanded those two to be fruitful and multiply. Isn't that something? It's unique in all creation. Marriage and the raising up of children in marriage is God's specially chosen method to populate the earth, all as part of subduing it and exercising dominion over it. You know, there's a lot of truth in the old saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. You know that one? It's talking about mothers. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world because those hands are raising up generations of kings and queens who will themselves contribute to the rule over God's creation for His glory. So mothers, dear sisters of Providence Church who have become mothers by God's design, you have an incredibly important task. Do not let the feminist movement of our Western world convince you that motherhood is some secondary thing, that it is second to a career. Motherhood itself, career doesn't cut it, it's a calling. 
It's a calling from God which he fills with great honor. It is second to none. Marriage truly is the building block of society. It's part of God's holy design and plan. And any effort to make marriage into something other than the union of one man and one woman, any such effort is from the devil. Let's be really clear about that. Whether it's the homosexual perversion called same-sex marriage, or whether it's the Mormon corruption called polygamy, or whether it's common law living practiced widely in our culture, or the divorce for any reason thinking, all of these aim to undermine the redeeming work of Christ by destroying God's pattern and preventing man from going forward with his dominion as God's image. Stop marriage or twist it or corrupt it or break it down and you will be breaking down the kingdom of God. That's why the devil is after it so badly in our society today. And we, we who are married in the Lord, we work to promote the redeeming labor of Christ right in our own homes and families. It's important that we connect marriage to this task of of exercising dominion over the earth. God will reveal more particulars about that in Genesis 2, but already in here in our text, verse 28, chapter 1, the Lord speaks in a summary way about marriage, male and female, in a relationship that would produce offspring, children who would grow up and take their place beside mom and dad to themselves exercise dominion over the earth. And let's see here, verse 28, that... God issues this as a command. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Having children for married couples is not optional. It's commanded. Now, I know there are legitimate exceptions to this rule in our fallen world. God also gives to some individuals the gift of being content as a single person so that they neither marry nor have children. The Lord Jesus speaks about such persons who choose to remain single in order to concentrate more fully on serving God's kingdom. The Apostle Paul was one such person. And a single person like that, they've, they've got special, uh, different opportunities and responsibilities to exercise dominion over the earth and to spread the kingdom of God. And such a single person should absolutely be respected and loved and embraced by the congregation just as much as any married person. We, we, should, we should work on that, I think, as congregations. You can also think of married folks who physically are unable to have children or who have perhaps received one or two but are prevented from having more, and they would like more. As a result of sin throughout all creation, this kind of thing does happen. It's often a source of grief and sorrow. Think of biblical examples like Rachel or Hannah or Elizabeth. But their very sorrow, brothers and sisters, and their isolation from the majority proves that they are exceptions to the general rule that married people, and then especially married believers, they ought to be fruitful and multiply. Which leads to this conclusion, if you really have no interest in having children, if you don't want kids, if that's your thinking, then do not get married. Because marriage comes with the command to be fruitful and multiply. And if you don't want to obey God's command, then don't go after marriage. Stay single. Why should we desire children? They should not be desired in the first place because children are so cute, although they are. There's a whole row of them here and they're sprinkled everywhere. They are cute. But children are not to be desired for that reason, nor as a source of pride for ourselves. They are to be a source of glory for God. A lot of people today, they want kids in order to have 
what's in their mind, a nice uh, model family, kind of a designer family, one boy, one girl, one for dad, one for mom. That's how the world thinks. But the children are not for mom and for dad. They are for the Lord. You know, the children, they don't even, they don't even come from mom and dad ultimately. Of course, they come from their bodies, but they are a gift from the Lord through those bodies. Brothers and sisters, bearing children, being fruitful, must be connected with that task of having dominion over the earth as people made in the image of God of God and doing it for His glory. Let's not forget that. These families we're building is not for us, for the Lord. The Lord Jesus has renewed that part of creation too. The Apostle Paul gives a number of commands in his letters about bearing children and managing households. So that gives purpose and meaning to childbearing. It's not just to keep the human race going, it's also to expand the kingdom of God through the raising up of new kings and queens. I want to pause over this for just a moment longer. Some people think that Jesus Christ has actually changed the mandate. And by mandate, I'm referring to the cultural mandate. That's what it's usually called here in Genesis 1.28. Some people think that Jesus has changed that cultural mandate when he gave the great commission at the end of Matthew. So that's why we read those verses at the end of Matthew. You know the great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Some say that commission replaces the mandate of Genesis. There's an idea creeping into Christian circles that this commandment is, uh, supersedes the earlier one, which leads some to suggest that it's okay for a married couple to decide not to have children so that they can focus on mission and kingdom work. So they, they, they pit the Great Commission over against the cultural mandate, and they say, this one cancels out this one. But brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus never does that. That is erroneous thinking, to say the least. Neither here nor anywhere in Scripture does Jesus in, or God or the Holy Spirit indicate that the creation command is now canceled or altered, much less substituted. The human race still has that first command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, to steward it as vicegerents. We'll sing about it in Psalm 128. And we Christians who know this, we should be at the forefront of all these things, the forefront of bearing children, the forefront of developing earth's potential, the forefront of caring for creation and developing culture and caring for the green earth God has given us and doing it for the glory of the Lord. We ought to be leaders in all those things. You see, that great commission of Matthew 28 doesn't replace the cultural mandate. It expands it. What do I mean? Well, the Great Commission says, go therefore and make disciples of many nations. Planet Earth now has many hundreds of nations that do not know God, the King, do not know Jesus, the Messiah, who are not living for the King's glory. They're not reflecting the image of God. They're all sons and daughters of Adam, but they're not reflecting God's image. They're reflecting the fallen image of Adam, so many. The Great Commission then calls us as church to reach out to those people with the gospel so that they too will hear of the only Savior, Jesus, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit they can begin to believe in Jesus and start living as the image of God and bear fruit for God's honor. When we teach new believers... All that Christ has commanded us, Matthew 28, does that not include the original creation mandate? Doesn't Christ teach us the original mandate? Remember what we've seen in earlier sermons, Jesus is creator together with the Father and the Spirit. So the commands of Genesis 1 are not just the Father's commands, they're equally the Son's commands. As new believers then, just like existing believers, they are rightly expected to follow also those commands. Yes, get married unless you have the gift of singleness. Get married. 
Produce and raise godly offspring. Do your daily work as part of exercising dominion over the earth, just like all the other Christians. That's why Paul, you'll find Paul giving commands in his letters. Check out Colossians or Ephesians at some point today. The latter part of each of those letters, he gives commands concerning marriage, parenting, and work. Reflective of Genesis 1 the creation mandate. And isn't it true that God's been gathering for himself a church from the children of believers, from covenant children throughout the ages? Even as since the time of Pentecost, he's gathering in new adult believers through evangelism and mission? These things go together. They're not oppositional. Evangelism and being missional in no way cancels out having babies and raising a family. For consider what, what's under your roof. Doesn't every mother have in her children full-time disciples of Jesus right in her home? Those are also part of the nations that need discipling, our own kids. As a mom, as a dad, your number one missional task, your disciple-making task is right there in the olive shoots around your table. Who's going to disciple your kids if it's not you, mom and dad? Spend time raising your children well in the way of the Lord and don't feel guilty about that either. And then raising the children, by the way, is not just the task for the mums. It's equally the role of the fathers. Our text says God said to them, male and female, be fruitful and multiply. So Adam and Eve are in that together, not just on the, the physical side of conceiving a child, but also on the responsibility side of raising the child. It's very true that frequently the mother will be the primary caregiver in the home, and the father may well be outside the home working to develop creation's potential there. But don't forget, fathers, the children God placed in your care. You're a dad. That's a calling as well. Mothers will certainly teach, but fathers, you need to be in the game wholeheartedly. Think of Proverbs. Proverbs is almost the whole of Proverbs can be understood as a, as a father speaking to his son. Think of for example, chapter 4, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction. Be attentive that you may gain insight. That Israelite father was busy teaching his sons and daughters. How about it, fathers of Providence Church? Are you busy teaching your sons and daughters? You know, in our Reformed community, we often have a high regard for work, labor, and that's good. But we, do we have just as high a regard for teaching our kids, for sitting down with them in those little moments and in the big moments and talking to them and listening to them and dialoguing with them? You can be at work 12 hours a day, six days a week, subduing the earth, but are you putting a parallel effort into raising those little ones the Lord has given you? The same God who commands us to work also commands us to teach and raise our children in the fear of his name. Don't let work cancel out the other. Don't let your hobbies or your leisure time do that either. Keep all these things in biblical balance. Do them all well. And that's, that's something, too, we should take home with us today, you know, in Christ, in the redemption that Christ provides, life is not to be a rat race. You ever feel sometimes that that's what life is? We're just, we're on a hamster wheel and we're going around and around and around and we barely get up and it seems we're back at our beds at night and we've been busy, busy, busy and uh, repeat the next day and repeat the next day and repeat the next day. We have to get off the hamster wheel, be intentional, because Jesus makes life dignified and purposeful. 
you don't just work 40 years and then drop dead from exhaustion and that's all there is, like the world sometimes thinks. God put you here and me to live in sweet fellowship with Him, to enjoy your daily labor as part of walking with Him each day, all to His honor. Christ has redeemed you and me from slavery to sin to enable us to live that way again. So brothers and sisters, work in that respect. Have that vision when you labor, when you parent. Work hard, parent diligently, but keep the vision. Conduct yourself with honor to show something of God's holiness to the world. Teach your children all about these things. And when you have opportunity, let your neighbor in on all these blessings too that you found by God's grace. Pass on the, the crown of grace that God has given you. Pass it on to the next generation. Pass it on to folks you meet in the community. And then watch God grow his kingdom right into eternity. Amen.